Hello, and welcome back to the IT Pro Podcast. I'm Adam Shepherd, and this week I'm joined once again by Kumar's Afifi Sabet. Kumar's, welcome back. Thanks, Adam. Uh, good to be back. Now, this week we're going to be talking about programming languages, and I understand that you've actually used Lockdown productively and taught yourself some coding. Yeah, that's that's right. I, I don't know what got into me, but I decided, uh, I think it was around September, to take up a beginner's Python course. Um, I think it was the free time and the fact that I think I've always been interested in programming and in coding, but I've never actually taken that leap and, and done a course. I've never actually done any computing studies or anything like that, nothing at university. So uh, I, I felt it's the perfect time to do it. And I'll see whether or not it's for me, whether I enjoy it or not. Now, while learning a new programming language is always an impressive feat, getting an entire engineering organization to learn a new language is a different prospect altogether. But that's exactly what Bloomberg has done. The organization has recently moved all of its engineers, as well as its entire code base, from JavaScript to TypeScript. And we're joined today by Thomas Chetwin, the co-chair of Bloomberg's JavaScript Guild, to learn more about how Bloomberg pulled off this switch and what it hopes to gain. Thomas, welcome to the show. Hi, Adam. Hi, Kumas. Uh, thanks for having me on the show. Hi, Thomas. Uh, so before we dive into the details of this program, can you tell us a little bit more about Bloomberg's technology and your role as part of Bloomberg? Because I would imagine that most of our listeners are probably familiar with certain aspects of Bloomberg as a company, but maybe not how the whole technology piece fits into it. Yeah, sure. So uh, Bloomberg as a company has um, been providing uh, technology and, and financial information for a good few years now. Um, many of the viewers may have may be familiar with the kind of um, Bloomberg.com arm of, of Bloomberg, which produces um, a, a financial news uh, website, um, often, often linked to from your usual news uh, aggregators and sources. Um, but behind the scenes uh, for, for many is, a, is what was actually the kind of like the, the larger part of the iceberg, which is the, the Bloomberg terminal. Uh, which is a, a desktop application, uh, which is kind of like a, a web browser for finance. Um, uh, and it's just like a browser. It's built using similar technologies. It, um, we, we embed a tool called Chromium, which is the, the magic behind the Chrome browser. Um, and uh, we write our applications using JavaScript. Um, and the, the terminal supports, um, I think it's on the order of 10,000 applications. And these, wow. these vary in size from being a single uh, screen, relatively static in nature, that helps you perform one single financial calculation or look up one thing to much more complicated ecosystems where you can uh, watch orders come in and place, make trades and do and do things like that. So a real uh, plethora of stuff there. Mm. And if you've ever seen a trading floor or a, a financial <laughs> house, uh, most of the computer screens that you'll be able to see will almost certainly be running at Bloomberg's terminal or something very similar. Yeah, it's very, very common to see that. Uh, there have been a few um, things recently on, on TV and in films. There's been The Big Short, uh, The Billions, and uh, Industry TV series, where um, there's, there's been a lot of um, uh, placement of Bloomberg software software and hardware, in fact. Uh, and as you say, it's it's very common on a trading floor. It, it's, it's, it's alien to me, but for, for a client, having maybe six monitors, of which um, maybe they have uh, financially, bits of the terminal ticking away on five of them is, is not uncommon. Uh, I, don't, I don't know how they do it. <laughs> <laughs> well, as we uh, discussed in a previous episode, the only reason I don't have five or six monitors is that I physically can't fit them on my desk. I can only imagine the trading floors are very hot with uh, all, all of the monitors and computers wearing away. But... <laughs> so, Thomas, tell us more about what prompted the change from JavaScript to TypeScript? Because I understand that, you know, an organization of Bloomberg's size with, you know, as you mentioned, the the high amount of apps that are running on the terminal platform, that's got to be a lot of code and a lot of JavaScript code that has to be refactored and reformatted. So what prompted this change? Yeah. So, um, so to, first of all, in terms of the, the magnitude, we've been uh, you could say collecting JavaScript or accumulating JavaScript <laughs> since um, t 2005, um, where we uh, on our original uh, JavaScript-based UI platform, where we've been uh, running the JavaScript largely on the server side rather than the client side, which is more the norm now. Um, 
but it's, uh, as I say, accumulated to tens of millions of lines of code. Um, so as is a big, a big corpus to begin with. So in terms of uh, what prompted the migration, uh, TypeScript provides a, a level of uh, maturity and safety to the code that's not present with JavaScript. So a kind of example, if you if you imagine stepping into uh, a few of those tens of millions of lines, you've you're, you've scrolled halfway down the page and you're looking at a couple of functions, uh, uh, as in uh, pieces of JavaScript code. Mm. The language itself doesn't really give you um, many tools to figure out what the shape of different things flowing through are at any given point in time. Um, you kind of have to infer that by figuring out how you got to that part in the code and how things built up leading to that and, and, and where they go from there. Um, so what TypeScript is, rather than being an altogether different language, it's kind of like uh, JavaScript with, with extra bits added. And the, the bits which are added, as the name maybe suggests, are types. And what, what types are to a programming language are, they're the, the annotations in the code that tell you the shape of things. So now when you zoom in on a, on a piece of code, assuming it's TypeScript and not JavaScript, there's much less, um, you don't need to scroll around as much to figure out the context. The context is etched into the, into the program itself. Uh, so you're no longer wondering whether or not uh, a particular a variable, a piece of state in the code, you don't, you now don't have to worry about whether it represents a number or a piece of text. It's, it's written in the code. There, there have been strategies to do this uh, in, in other languages and, and even JavaScript in the past using uh, comment strings, which are, are things which allow you to put um, human readable documentation in the code. Um, but uh, a common phenomenon that many, many programmers will be familiar with is that um, these tend to over time, they get forgotten about, or they maybe someone adds another line and it separates the comment from the original context or maybe the code changes, but the documentation isn't updated. And these things start to diverge. And this, this is often referred to as a rot within the code. Whereas with TypeScript, these aren't a thing that uh, kind of bolted on the side. They are an integral part of the, of the line of code. And you, you can't have it in an incorrect state because the tool, the TypeScript compiler tool, uh, will, will basically yell at you. It'll tell you, you can't put a number in that, in that text. It just doesn't make sense. Um, so it, it makes the language, uh, have this typing property, which is a, a lot more similar to um, other languages. Um, so it sounds like this is kind of really geared around code hygiene and uh, code maintainability. Yes, I precisely. Right. That, that's, a, that's a great way to put it, the, the maintainability. Um, and uh, often often one of the like rebuttals to, I've seen to, to, to TypeScript has been, um, I don't need to write down what the shape of my objects is. I know what the shape is. And, and we've all been there. We've we've written a piece of code, and, and we're in the middle of it, and we know we know exactly what's going on because we've got the whole thing loaded into our heads. It's maybe only a few hundred lines long, and, and we wrote all of them. But if you try coming back to that piece of code in six months' time, or if you give it to one of your colleagues, the context is all gone, and so you're you're, you're back at square one. Um, and so uh, the maintainability mm -hmm. aspect is the fact that you can write something and give it to anyone in the organization, and uh, at least at a very micro level, they know exactly what's going on. They don't have to hunt around. I mean, inversely, are there any uh, key benefits of JavaScript over TypeScript? So uh, this is kind of a, a, a great a great point about um, TypeScript is that it in, in, innately has all the benefits of JavaScript because one, um, one, one step I haven't mentioned is that in order to run your TypeScript code, you pass it through a, a step called the, the TypeScript compiler. And this takes all of the additional bits of syntax you've added, the, the type annotations, it makes sure they all make sense, and then it throws them away. So what you're left with, if, if you imagine the original formula was JavaScript plus types, if you throw away the types, you have JavaScript left. So you have all of those benefits. One potential uh, thing that could be viewed as, a, as an inconvenience is, is the fact that you now need to have this compile step. If you're writing vanilla JavaScript, you can, you can run it straight away, whereas with TypeScript, there's one step involved. Um, but the kind of... If you put this into the context of uh, modern JavaScript development, many people's tool chains, I, I would go as far as saying the vast majority, already have a build step. It, it's very common for people to want to write syntax, uh, which was introduced to the language in the last uh, you know, three or four years, uh, but maybe they're targeting all of the browsers. It's, it's, it's very common for people to want to target, uh, e even today, with it maybe being very deprecated, they still want to target IE11. Um, IE11 doesn't know about JavaScript features from uh, four years ago or three years ago. So it's very common to have a build step that turns modern code into compatible code. And so the idea of adding in a step which also removes the types is, is suddenly not such a big deal. 
I think saying IE doesn't uh, know about JavaScript features from four years ago is being very charitable. I was being a bit charitable. <laughs> I, 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 don't know, I don't know the exact point in time at which they um, they, they stopped tracking JavaScript developments. Uh, all, all I know is that... Like, that, they, just, period? <laughs> <laughs> that may be true. All I know is that, uh, well, at least very modern Edge is based on Chromium, so you know, that criticism can't be made as, anymore. So aside from the maintainability aspect that we've already discussed, what are some of the goals of the migration project? What are you hoping to gain from moving to TypeScript? So we've, we've discussed how the, the, sh the shape of things is really important um, from the get, get, getting stuck in on a piece of code point of view um, and, and, and that kind of micro level. Um, if you zoom, zoom out, it's very common for code to be uh, grouped together into things called either packages or, or bundles. So rather than having all of our 10 million lines in you know, one, one file, it's split into multiple files and those files are split into multiple repositories. And in order mm -hmm. to know how one repository or package interfaces with another, um, you, you have an API. This is, this is something that's common to all languages. Um, and, and TypeScript actually allows, just like you, you type your within the file, you also type the, the edges of your program so that when you're using another package, you know exactly the shape of that API. So um, as you can imagine with, with as many apps as I said at the beginning, like tens of thousands, um, knowing how the, the libraries they depend on knowing the shape of those is, is important too. There's a couple of other benefits as well, which people will notice more, more immediately when they get stuck in, um, which is things like code completions. So if you're using an, an IDE or editor, which um, as you type is suggesting things that you might want to, to type next, it will. If you're using VS Code and you're not using TypeScript, so you're just using JavaScript, you might actually find under the hood that VS Code is using TypeScript for you. So it's actually capable of uh, kind of looking at your, your JavaScript, imagining that it's TypeScript, and then giving you code completions based on that. So even, even if you think you're wow. not a user, you might find that you're a user. Um, other, <laughs> other, other editors might do this as well, but certainly VS Code does. If, if you actually use TypeScript itself, though, um, you, you're definitely get, getting this enhancement. And um, it really starts to know maybe you've got an object and you're trying to get a property out of it. Um, it knows the names of those properties. So th there's a... Uh, it, it will help you there. And taking that even one step further, if you then make a typo in one of those names, right there in the editor, it will tell you you've made a typo. So before you've clicked save, before you've clicked run, um, it will put a red underline underneath the thing you've just typed, uh, which will sound very normal to people who come from maybe a, a C sharp background or, or another programming language. Um, but the the amount of time it saves, even if it's just that that save, maybe that's one second, maybe running it, maybe that's a few more seconds. If you, if you multiply that by the number of typos you can make it, it really adds up. Uh, and uh, mm. I mentioned C-sharp, then there's actually a, a reason TypeScript maybe shares some similarities with C-sharp, and that's the, uh, the creator of TypeScript, Anders Halsberg, is also the creator of uh, C-sharp, as well as some other languages too. So uh, it, if it shares any similarities, you might, that, that origin story maybe is the, the reason. Mm. Very mm. strong pedigree there. Mm -hmm. Well, it's time for us to take a quick break, but when we come back, we will be talking about the challenges Bloomberg faced as part of the migration to TypeScript, as well as how it's going to enable Bloomberg's future tech development. Welcome back, and um, let's uh, just dive straight into the challenges uh, that Bloomberg might have faced during this migration. So, Thomas, I imagine... Um, such an operation demanded some level of scale. What were the key obstacles that you uh, were anticipating before you got into the migration? That's a, that's a good question. So we, we didn't try to convert all 10 million lines of code on, on one day. That would have been um, the, the, like, mm. the that, that's one end of the scale. Um, and the other end of the scale is trying to uh, increase the amount of, of TypeScript in, in kind of a bubble gradually um, and, and, and safely. So uh, we didn't want to, we, we couldn't take a year off. We couldn't tell everyone to stop, you know, put down their tools and not develop for a year. So this all had to be able to be um, done as part of, you know, normal business operation. Um, so we, we started off ensuring everything could be undone as, as quickly as it was done. So uh, again, going back to that formula again, a TypeScript is JavaScript plus types. At any point in time, if there was any kind of issue, we could eject, we could throw away the types, and we'd still have something that was JavaScript and, and still work. So that was kind of a, a key initial principle. And then we started with um, 
we have a model internally when, when you have enough engineers this this is a common model to, to sort of shake out where um, we provide this as an infrastructure team and then we have lots of application teams that, that make those apps um, and we would work with um, other application teams internally who are keen on being involved in this as a kind of a pilot and we would work very closely with them in, in initially to see what kind of challenges they would face so in this initial period we had a very small um, adoption and we had very high feedback like like a very um high bandwidth channel with, with these um, developers to find out everything that happened and for, for a while we you know we're, we're, our time is kind of saturated dealing with these things but over time the number of issues and, and like adoption uh, challenges um, tend, tends downwards and, and as that happens you, you grow the set of people and then you discover all kinds of new challenges challenges of scale challenges of just different perspectives and um, it's basically this iterative process of increasing the set finding new challenges solving the problems increase the set new challenges solve the problems uh, until eventually you, you've got to a point where um, you, you sort of as you increase the, the, the size of the, the set the, the number of challenge just doesn't go up anymore and you, and you realize you've you've kind of plateaued at the the stable point uh, and that that's when um, hmm. I believe it was back in uh, November last year that we truly had been in a, a, a sort of satisfactory kind of plateau state for a while and we and we opened it up to um, the, the entirety of the organization so uh, now anyone can convert their app to, to typescript um, and we have certainly onboarded um, many many of the uh, the largest apps already I, I point at these challenges. The, the main one is that even a more more granular than, than picking a team to TypeScript their code, as we said before, code is often uh, factored into multiple files. And one file builds on top of another, builds on top of another. They, they depend on each other. Um, and when a TypeScript file depends on another file, if that file is JavaScript, it doesn't know the shape of what's, what's going on inside that file. And so it, it will struggle. You, you have to actually kind of artificially tell it the shape of that file. Um, and so you either you either do that by converting it to TypeScript itself, or you do it by putting in a, a placeholder called a, a declaration, which is sort of you saying, I haven't turned this into TypeScript yet, but here's the, here's what I'm telling you the shape of it is. So this kind of gives you a, a fork in the road. There's, there's two ways you can go. You can either start at the top of your stack and, and I wouldn't say lie, but tell TypeScript about the shape of the <laughs> other files. Or you can start at the very bottom and you can start from the file which has no dependencies. It's the bottom of the, the pyramid, as it were. And there's no one answer about which is more right. If you start at the bottom, it might be it might be longer before people are able to, to benefit from those types, but you you do less of this um, declaration work. You, you, you spend more time purely converting. Whereas if you start at the top, you might have to kind of make up what the shape of the bits below are, but maybe if another library or another package depends on you, maybe they see some value sooner. So um, trying out both of these approaches and um, uh, in the end, ultimately different people like different things. So supporting both of these approaches um, was a real key, key learning for us. Mm. Now, speaking of dependencies, financial services is obviously one of those industries where uptime and reliability is possibly you know more important than than anything else and particularly when it's an application like bloomberg terminal which is used by traders on a kind of per second basis and is involved with you know huge transfers and huge sums of money was there any kind of apprehension around you know whether or not these changes could potentially uh, introduce reliability issues for your end users yes certainly um uh, in, in every change we make we have to consider the potential uh, the potential impacts of it and, and make sure uh, as kind of a standard software engineering practice that we uh, that we know how we can undo the change we make or we um we make we you know we document alternatives that we've considered and things like that in the case of um typescript adoption those um i think i'm not sure if i use the term escape hatches but th those are those are a key thing that <laughs> At any point in time, if we realized this was going the wrong way, that we would have the ability to uh, jump back to what we knew was a good state. Um, uh, so in that, in that instance, it would be going back from TypeScript to just being JavaScript again. Um, okay. and, and that option was on, on the, we were aware of that option from you know day zero, day, day one. Um, and that's always been available and still is available to us today. We also, again, uh, as a, a normal software engineering practice, whenever we um, make a change to one of these apps, and we start to roll it out. We use increasing, like kind of exponentially increasing populations of um, first internal users and then eventually external users as well. 
um, to uh, and mon monitor it closely during the rollout for any kind of uh, defect. And then we also just in our system, if, if we were to notice something down the line, we have uh, uh, mature kind of rollback strategies to get back to a, a known good state. So um, I think we've we've developed over a number of years um, good hygiene in that respect. In fact, um, it kind of points back to one of the reasons we adopted JavaScript originally. The architecture we had kind of pre-2005, while it did allow all of these things I said, the, the speed at which they could be performed was much, it was much slower. So it was slower to roll something new out and it was slower to pull it back again, or at least it was more impactful when it was pulled back. Um, by mm. chunking everything into lots of individual uh, JavaScript apps, each one of these individual apps could be you know, pushed out or pulled back um, from, from release. Uh, more quickly without impacting others around it. So the ability to use a scripting language like JavaScript and, and now TypeScript for that has um, has been a huge uh, boon to Bloomberg. Yeah, I can imagine it's been a real enabler for kind of velocity of development and the ability to kind of work on things in, in parallel. Yeah, certainly. Uh, it, it completely uh, frees teams up to be able to work in, work in parallel. That's a, that's a great point. During the migration process, did you find that your teams and staff were working in different ways than they normally would as a result of what was happening, perhaps that you didn't plan? So some teams were having to uh, devote um, some time to to the conversion process itself. Um, so it, there were a different depending on the strategy you adopt. Sometimes you might um, a, a team would adopt TypeScript over a, a very long period of time. Again, starting from those building blocks and and week by week as they progress their feature work, kind of um, converting as they go along. Um, maybe other teams would take more of a pause for a couple of weeks and do it and do a very big, uh, big conversion. But uh, on the on the grand scheme of things, the even one of the larger numbers of weeks pause isn't isn't too impactful. Uh, it, it's not like anyone had to take six months off to do a conversion. And speaking of staffing, I imagine conventionally anyway, training and uh... Adoption are key obstacles for every migration. So um, how did Bloomberg handle this? That's a good question. Um, so, so one thing is that TypeScript has been uh, maturing in the industry for, for a number of years now. I couldn't say, wouldn't say exactly, but I'd say uh, at least five. Um, so a lot, of, a lot of people who consider themselves to be JavaScript developers already know it's coming. They already, they already are familiar with it. In fact, in many cases, they're, they're you know, demanding that it be made available because um, it, the, the value is, is clear to so many. Um, so that, that was a, one of our big motivators. Um, in terms of uh, training for the people who ha hadn't already decided to learn about it on their own, uh, there were some great resources online. And one that everybody always points back to is the, the Microsoft Teams TypeScript handbook it, itself, um, which is a, a great resource. Uh, the other thread we have is that we have um, within Bloomberg a, a training department um, with some really great technical trainers. And um, we've had a collaboration between uh, those of us in the in the team working on the, the TypeScript infrastructure, uh, those of us in the uh, a thing called the JavaScript Guild, uh, and and the trainers themselves to produce a course internally, uh, a couple of courses actually, one basic TypeScript and one intermediate TypeScript, which have a focus on uh, both TypeScript as a you know pure abstract language and also its uh, applications within Bloomberg specifically, and um, we've we've taught that class several times now. It's it's coincidental timing, but we're actually teaching it. Um, it's split over two days, and we're actually teaching it yesterday and today. So, oh, nice. Yeah. So that's that's been a, a great opportunity to um, help people upskill internally, and uh, I think we call it a continuing education internally. And it's a very very useful resource for the engineers. Now, you mentioned the JavaScript Guild. Uh, you're the co-chair of this guild. Can you tell us a little bit more about? what it does within Bloomberg, its kind of role and its its function. It's a very interesting one. Uh, guilds, um, the first time I'd heard of uh, guilds at Bloomberg, I thought that, that's a term I haven't heard in a long time. I think the first time I'd heard of it was in um, in a, a, a game, uh, Elder Scrolls Morrowind Mar Mar game. And it kind of harks back to <laughs> sort of, um, this, this me medieval notion. Also within the city of London as well, we have these this notion of guilds, which, which date back hundreds of years. Um, but Fundamentally, the, the, while maybe some of the practices have changed, the, the key concept, which is people um, kind of honing a craft, uh, still uh, lives on. So this is a model which Bloomberg adopted in uh, late 2016. And uh, I believe from the literature I've read that um, it's kind of borrowed from Spotify, who pioneered it in 2012. Uh, but it's an internal uh, group of um, uh, JavaScript enthusiasts 
there are also other guilds as well. It's not just JavaScript. We have other languages and other technologies and things. But it's a, a group of in, people internally who are knowledgeable and enthusiastic about JavaScript and, and TypeScript who want to spread that information to others within the community and, and uh, do things like organize events and organize things called working groups and, and things like that uh, to help spread the joy. <laughs> Uh, so what other kind of guilds and, and languages do you have within Bloomberg? I'm going to go out on a limb and guess that you've probably still got a couple of Fortran and COBOL engineers kicking around. I don't know about COBOL. I, I wouldn't rule out that we've ever had a line of COBOL, but it's certainly um, uh, it, it's down in the 0.0001% kind of uh, league. We do, we do still have some pieces of uh, Fortran, C, and, and C++. Well, we, we have a lot of C++. We, we actively develop in C++. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, we do still have um, C and Fortran link, linked in there. Um, those, those will be covered under the umbrella of the um, C++ guild internally, um, which okay. is uh, one, of, one of our large language guilds. We also, we also have a Python guild too. But then we, uh, we have kind of orthogonal to those guilds. We have other ones like automated testing um, and things like natural language processing and machine learning and things like that. So kind of uh, different kinds of skills. Mm, more application-based than language-based. Yeah, and uh, no, no two guilds look alike, but there are lots of kind of uh, th themes that run through them. Uh, one is the, the organizing of internal meetup events. Um, in, in some ways, that you could argue that that was the inspiration at Bloomberg for, for the guild model, is that we already had lots of these um, independently organized meetup groups, and, and guilds was just a, a formalization of those to, to give them a, like, like a framework for uh, just things like organizational platforms and expenses and things like that. Um, mm. So c conducting internal meetups are very much like external meetups. So sometimes guilds host external meetups. We've done that several times within the JavaScript guild. Um, and other things we have, um, we call them working groups. Uh, other things we have working groups for are uh, organizing JavaScript training, like I mentioned before, uh, but also sometimes pulling in a new technology. So the, the React working group uh, was, was really um key in making React available on some of our UI platforms. Um, and we also have one for the TC39 group. For anyone who's not familiar, the TC39 mm. is the name of the JavaScript standardization group. Um, and so we have uh, people that uh, represent Bloomberg at, at that forum, uh, including one of the, the co-chairs of that forum. Um, and so we spread information about that internally through that working group. So it's uh, mm. communications and events and learning and sharing. Yeah, it, it sounds kind of quite close to the open source community model and the way that community kind of interacts and uh, spreads spreads its message and kind of enhances its community goals through through that kind of model. Now, what kind of role did the uh, the guild play in increasing the adoption of TypeScript? Because while well, you mentioned that TypeScript is kind of fairly prevalent among the wider JavaScript community, there's usually at least a couple of holdouts who kind of prefer the old way and, you know, take a little bit of encouragement, shall we say, to get on board with the new plan and the new model. Yeah. Um, so the I, I'd have to dig through the archives, but um, people have been presenting about TypeScript in a JavaScript guild meetups since uh, before we started this this big migration. So the they, they, they kind of tend to be a, a, an early warning signal of, of things to come. People <laughs> like to talk about technologies which haven't haven't made it big yet, mm. and uh, that that's a trend both um, with our internal and, and external meetups. In terms of adoption, or, or pe people maybe um, uh, holding out or expressing skepticism about uh, TypeScript, um, specifically externally in in the last few years. There have been a lot of people who have, uh, especially on Twitter, kind of like questioned the value of TypeScript. And and, and we had a couple of examples internally of people who thought it, it wasn't for them. And I think um, over the years, we've I've seen many, many instances, especially on Twitter, of people completely reversing their opinion. Um, I think this is often when they've transitioned from maybe working more in a, in a kind of solo capacity and going back to that uh, idea of having the whole code base in their head. And then they've gone mm. back to interfacing maybe on a more regular basis with other people and realizing that the, the value of, of knowing what somebody else is doing without having to go back and read every line of their code is, is, is invaluable. <laughs> um, so I think that it, you could kind of jokingly put it, and, and someone has said this before, that it's it's not me that needs TypeScript, it's everybody else. 
Um, and I think I, th I think what they mean by that is that I need everybody else to be using TypeScript so that I, without reading their code, know what the code does. So I think that's a, a more positive framing of it. But I thought that was very funny. So looking further into the future, how does this migration ultimately uh, power the future technology roadmap of Bloomberg? I'm, I'm not sure what the future holds in terms of uh, further TypeScript development. I, I know for a fact there's been um, a, a restated commitment from the, the folks at Microsoft that it will uh, continue to track um, uh, what's known as the, the, the JavaScript standard. So, um, you know, in the, in the very early days of, a, of, a, of what's called a language superset in this case, so it's an, a, a base language like JavaScript plus extra features, it could go in. It could go in many different directions. It could have um, completely changed the syntax and turned into its own thing. Um, there, there was a language in the past called CoffeeScript, which, um, uh, while, while maybe not a direct su superset as such, um, it, it went in its own direction and it, and it added its own syntax. And um, it, while it's maybe not uh, achieved the same kind of success as TypeScript has today, it, it was influential in some ways on, on the, the base uh, JavaScript language. Um, but but TypeScript has has made it quite clear to us that they plan on sticking with JavaScript, so um, not not diverging in some uh, uh, untold direction, but just continuing to be complementary. Uh, and, that, and that stability is really uh, important to us. Um, we don't want to be in a situation where uh, the path forks and we have to pick a direction to go in. Um, mm -hmm. This was something that was very common during the the browser wars, where um, different JavaScript uh, implementations or, or that followed different specifications, you had to kind of choose whether or not you went for one or the other, or you had to try and straddle both, and you had to make your code work in, in, in both in both ways, um, which is, um, as, as the name Browser Wars suggests, it was painful for many, and there were casualties on, on, on all sides. Um, so we're, we're really enjoying this period of, um, this, is, this is kind of a specific t a JavaScript term, but this period of harmony in which everybody is at the, the same table, specifically the TC39 table, uh, and uh, working together to further uh, kind of like the, the, the central language. So in, in terms of future developments, more of the same, please. Uh, every, everything is, is going well. Um, on, on, <laughs> on that note, I would say that the, the Microsoft team, are, are, the way they um, operate TypeScript is, is admirable. It's, it's done uh, very openly. Um, if, you, if you were to go to the, the GitHub Microsoft TypeScript repository, um, you, you'll see many issues. Um, but that's not reflective of the fact that they're not answered. They are extremely engaged with the community. It's just there's such an interest that the, the flow in roughly matches the, the, the flow of them being answered. It's, it's so popular. Um, and they'll often personally engage with um, members of the community, uh, and they are a truly open source project. So um, they, they are, it's not just, and not, not to accuse anyone, but it's not a facade of an open source project. It, it truly does accept contributions from outside. Um, I, I can even uh, g give a shout out to Bloomberg for having itself um, uh, landed contributions within TypeScript. So specifically uh, a proposal called private fields and uh, even ongoing to this very day, uh, private methods as well, which are some uh, cutting edge pieces of um, core language syntax. So. Very nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Well, on that note, I'm afraid that's all we've got time for in this week's episode. But our thanks once again to Bloomberg's Thomas Chetwin for joining us. Yeah, thank you very much for having me. Thank you as well to Kumars for stepping in once again as my guest co-host. Thanks, Adam, and thanks, Thomas, for coming on. You can find more information on all of the topics we've spoken about today in the show notes and even more on our website, itpro.co.uk. You can also follow us on Twitter, Facebook and LinkedIn. And don't forget to subscribe to the show wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be back next week with more insight from the world of IT. But until then, goodbye. The IT Pro Podcast is brought to you by the Dennis Podcast Network.